Um, <clears throat> it's a yeah, it's a real pleasure to talk to uh, to you. Um, if I if I have time at the very end, I'll, I'll share some um, information about an initiative we have here uh, at Radboud, which is uh, you know quite inspired by the the centre there at Penn. So um, so it's a pleasure to get to talk to uh, people who uh, I view as real pioneers in this uh, societal so making societally relevant of uh, of kind of neuroscience. So what I want to talk about is, um, <clears throat> as Martha said, my own my focus is on decision making. And so uh, rather than look at kind of specific policy implications, what I want to do is give a, a kind of a brief tour of the field of decision neuroscience and uh, some work from my lab, which is really looking at the fundamental aspects of decision making, but with a view to how we can apply these insights to understanding um, policy and potentially influencing policy. So it'll be a bit of a <clears throat> overview. I'm, I'm happy to go in, of course, uh, at greater length to any particular study. But uh, the, the main goal is to give a flavor of the kind of methods we and others use. And hopefully you can see where we might be able to use the insights for uh, societal good. So, um, you know, I really think a, a fundamental fact of if we want to look at how to make society better is by understanding decision making. So it's really crucial for us, I think, to understand uh, our own behavior, uh, but also to help uh, enact optimal public policy. It's if we don't understand how people are making decisions in the first place, it's very difficult to try and influence them in any kind of positive way. Um, so I think this is a laudable goal and something I've been working on for quite a long time. But there's two problems, I think, which have emerged uh, with this with this uh, overall goal. So one problem is that um, within the, the scientific fields of decision making, there's a lot of different disciplines studying decision making at quite different levels, as I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. And I think there's been relatively poor contact between these disciplines. So decision making, I think, is a field that, that cries out for an inter interdisciplinary approach. Uh, but until relatively recently, they had been quite siloed across different fields. And the decision neuroscience is an effort to try and bring better contact between these disparate fields. And the second problem um, is that often we policy is influenced by what we can measure. So we, we look at what we can measure. So can we measure people's risk preferences easily? Well, we can do that. We can give people gambles and we can get a sense of how risky people are. Um, but I think often that lacks some deeper insight into how people are actually making decisions. So um, one thing we, we're going to try and do, as I'll hopefully show, is that we really try and get a, a, a deeper insight into what pe how people are actually making choices, not simply how we can easily read off preferences, which may not be terribly robust in the, in the real world. So these are the two problems, which I'm rather grandiosely now going to try and uh, claim that we have some answers for. Mm -hmm. um, so this is very much a beginning endeavor. Uh, I, will, I will caveat that up front. And um, I'm also very interested to hear both today and, and hopefully in future dialogue as to how we really can bring these insights to bear on public policy. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, this is a, a challenge. Um, but uh, it would be great to get the, the benefit of your own experience also. Okay, so in terms of what we mean by decision making and standard, what we can call, say, standard approaches to studying decision making. And there's, as I said, many fields have done this. I'm going to just focus on a few. So obviously, psychology has been, uh, you know, quite, quite uh, dominant since the time of uh, Kahneman and Tversky and before that, since people like Herbert Simon. So um, where the dominant model within psychology has been this kind of heuristics and biases approach. So we look and see what people do, and we'll actually look and see where the decisions break. So we look at these kind of uh, biases that people have, where people deviate from, from kind of optimal and rational models. And that tends to be the way psychological approaches have, have gone. And so they've built what we can really term descriptive models. So this is what people do. And there has been a bias there towards this is what people do incorrectly. Um, at the same time, economics, of course, has been studying decision making for you know several hundred years now. Uh, but has a quite a different approach. So using models like utility theory and, and variance thereof has really focused on what we can call prescriptive models. So these are models of how one should make decisions. So how do you make an optimal choice? Well, economics tends to have very useful models for trying to uh, uh, understand that. But of course, the flaw here is that um, these models don't tend to be terribly accurate at understanding what people actually do. Um, and given that we live in a <clears throat> noisy and uncertain world, uh, it's it's you know I think this is a, a limitation of the economic models. 
And similarly, neuroscience has been chugging along, doing looking at decision making also for, for quite a long time. But un, until, of course, very recently, the type of decisions that could be studied by directly examining the brain were rather limited because of you know, methodological limitations that it's hard to stick electrodes into people um, until you know, the advent of fMRI and other neuro, neuroimaging methods. The type of decisions studied in neuroscience had been rather low level perceptual decisions. So which way does a rat run in a maze? Which button does a monkey press? to get a reward and so on. So um, the real, I think, value in decision neuroscience has been to try and bring these fields together and look at the intersection. So how can we use insights from these different disciplines the kind of descriptive approach of psychology, the, the, <clears throat> the kind of computational uh, and formal approach of economics, and of course, the neurobiological constraints um, uh, seen with neuroscience, how can we use all these to try and build better models, to try and understand better how we choose and decide. And that, that's the goal of this uh, field. Um, we use lots of different methods, as Martha alluded to. So um, I'll try and give a flavor of, of several of these. Uh, obviously, individual behavior. We want to know what people do. We want to know what different groups of people do in different contexts. So these are you know, essentially psychology. Obviously, brain imaging gives us some insight into the, 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 the mechanisms that are underlying these choices. Um, we use a lot now of computational modeling, which is, a, I find, a much more rigorous way of, of assessing uh, whether our models work or not, if we have to actually formalize them in, in equations. Uh, and we do studies using things like hormones and genetics to look at how, the, how we can perturb the system and what that tells us about the underlying uh, choice mechanisms. So standard approaches have, have given us several insights. So I just want to give a very quick example of, of these are kind of canonical studies of decision-making in the lab to show both what they've shown us, but also show us maybe what the limitations are. So this is a very standard task. If you uh, signed up for a decision-making study, we'd bring you into the lab and we give you a very simple choice. We'd say you can flip a coin, a fair coin. So there's no, no trickery here. If the coin lands heads, you win a thousand dollars. If the coin lands on tails, you win nothing. So that's option A. Or you can have option B, which is that I will give you $500 for sure, and you can go about your business and not, no need for any coin flipping. And the choice we simply ask participants is, which would you choose? Um, I, it's a bit tricky to do this in Zoom. We've done this many, 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 many times. It's, uh, it's the one demonstration I do because it always works. And the result is that overwhelmingly, usually about 80% of people uh, choose the $500 for sure. So if you're playing along, um, probably most of you chose that. <clears throat> now, there's nothing, of course, right or wrong about this. This is a choice preference. Um, but one kind of notable thing is from a strictly uh, economic perspective, if we're going for very kind of traditional economic models, that these two options have what have the same what's called expected value. That is, on average, the coin flipping, you'll win 500 euros. Sorry, I have to change my currency for these uh, US stocks. $500. Um, so half the time you'll win 1,000, half the time you'll win nothing. So on average, you'll win $500. And on the uh, sure thing option, you also win $500. So people should, according to the, the models, be indifferent, but they aren't. They have a very clear preference. And so this has been taken to illustrate what people call risk aversion. People don't like uncertainty they don't like risk and they'd rather take the 500 dollars for sure than take the chance of winning a thousand as i said this is extremely robust and if we wanted to lure you into uh, become gamblers i'd have to offer about a two thousand dollars for that heads that's a, that's the point which most people will say well it's probably worth the risk okay so so we can use gambles like this to establish concepts like risk aversion and then i can bring you back into the lab and give you give you another uh, problem here so um, <clears throat> this looks very similar on its, on its face. So again, you can either flip a coin, but this time you can imagine I have some experimental method which enables me to extract money from you. So uh, this time, if it's heads, you lose $1,000, right? You have to pay up uh, to me $1,000. Whereas if it's tails, you lose nothing. So you walk out uh, um, uh, free. Um, or you can just give me $500 right now and uh, we will kind of call it quits. So now, of course, this is the, essentially the same uh, gamble, uh, except I've just changed the signs. Now we're in the, the loss domain instead of the gain domain. And what we find now is that the vast majority of people now choose the gamble. So what we've shown here is two things. One is this is what's called a preference reversal. So people are now choosing the risk, whereas in the previous example, they didn't. Um, and th so this illustrates that 
people clearly are not only concerned with avoiding risk because here people are choosing the risk. And this illustrates the principle of what we call loss aversion. That is, it's extremely painful just to hand over $500 to me for nothing. Um, that hurts. So you'd rather take the chance that maybe you can get out of here uh, with nothing. And of course, this has been uh, proposed to underlie many, many kind of problematic gambling behaviors, right? There, you're chasing, uh, chasing losses and so on. So, so I, I show this to illustrate that these, this, these kind of simple examples have, have shown us a lot, have shown us a lot about what people do in different circumstances. But what we'd like to do, I think, with this research program is kind of move beyond these uh, simple gambles and move beyond these kind of lab lab uh, lab tests, which are a little bit divorced, I think, from the real world. So, so how do we do that? So uh, we do it in a variety of ways. So a lot of our work in our lab is, is try to be inspired by real world decisions and choices. So we don't take kind of abstract gambles and so on. So uh, this is just some examples. And, and what I want to do over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so is give you a little insight into how we study these, how we can try and study these um, uh, you know, properly in the lab, but also that they have potential real world uh, implications. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is the, the topic of, kind of poverty in decision making. So obviously, there has been a lot of research over a long time, uh, suggesting that when people are poor, they make qualitatively different decisions. Uh, often these decisions are, are suboptimal, certainly from a usually a financial sense. And up until you know, relatively recently, the perceived wisdom has been that you know poor people make bad decisions. That's why they're poor. Um, but true, due to some, I think, quite interesting work um, from well, from the East Coast over there, um, suggests that maybe the, the 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 feeling or the state of poverty itself may in fact lead to different types of decisions. So this is kind of the notion of scarcity. That is, um, when you're when you're poor, when resources are scarce. This may just change your, your preferences in, in kind of locally optimal ways, but that have, are generally poorer for you in the long run, but are explainable. So it's not that you're just making kind of bad slash stupid decisions, but that uh, the decision criteria shift. So we wanted to study this in the, in the context of simple consumer choice. So does the feeling of not having enough lead to changes in how we decide uh, when people are simply asked to purchase very simple consumer products, the type of things you'd see in the, in the supermarket? Uh, but of course, we wanted to do this in the lab uh, to see, and we wanted to do this uh, using fMRI to see what kind of brain mechanisms might underlie uh, altered decision making due to scarcity. So um, as with all of the uh, examples I'm going to give, I'll, I'll skim rather briefly through the details. I'm happy to go through them later. But uh, what you need to know about this task is that um, we, we set this up as a, a three-stage game. And the Participants were told they had to kind of progress from stage one to stage two, stage two to stage three. And if they progressed through stage three, they got to win some mess uh, some money. And this is a very simple perceptual detection task. They just saw patterns of dots on the screen and had to choose which uh, pattern had the most dots. So it was a, it was a, a kind of a cognitive uh, task. Uh, but the, 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 the trick for this game was that we made it quite difficult for people to progress through different stages. And what we told participants was in order to move from stage one to stage two, you had to have a kind of a positive balance. So every time they got a question right, they got a token. Every time they got a question wrong, we took a token away. And in order to progress from stage one to stage two, they needed to have a positive uh, greater than zero balance. And then we could simply have two conditions uh, for our participants. Uh, one condition is what we call the abundance condition. And here we simply, at the beginning of the game, we just gave them a lot of tokens up front. And so they knew that based on their performance, there was never really any real danger of them not being able to progress. So that's what we call as the abundance condition, that there was a kind of an absence of scarcity here. And we wanted to contrast this to participants who were placed in the so-called scarcity condition. So here, at the begin, very beginning of the game, we gave them simply one token. And we manipulated their performance in the task such that they were always right around the thresholds. We wanted to kind of mimic this feeling of, I have barely enough resources and I, I, I have a very, I'm not really able to predict what my future resources are going to be. And then we simply, uh, so this was the manipulation to try and induce this feeling of scarcity versus abundance. But what, of course, we're interested in was how would this feeling impact their, their decisions in a simple consumer choice task? And so every now and then we would interrupt this perceptual task to give them a simple choice. And we would, uh, we used a, a, a BDM auction mechani mechanism here. 
whereby people would be given an, an item that is commonly seen in the supermarket. So here, a bag of M&Ms. And they would simply have to say, how much would I be willing to pay for this packet of M&Ms? And we, we made the uh, auction uh, incentive compatible and real so that at the end of the task, they would uh, we would randomly pick one of their bidding trials and they would either win that um, particular item or not. So and we had a little uh, store of M&Ms and somebody won a carrot once, which is <laughs> their disappointment. So um, so we had a variety of you know, very simple things. So we didn't want uh, any real status goods or prestige goods, which have been studied. We just wanted to see would um, the simple feeling of scarcity change people's preferences for these simple consumer items. And we found that it did in, in interesting ways that we didn't quite predict. What I'm showing you here are uh, the people's bids. So on the on the, the vertical axis here are, are what people were willing to bid in euros for a, for each item. So as you can see, this is really a small uh, small amounts of money. Uh, and on the on the the x-axis here, I'm showing you how much people liked the product. So everything to the right of zero are products that they liked on average. Everything to the left of zero are products that they were were less keen about. Right. So you know, generally, the M and M's were to the right, and the carrots and broccoli and so on were to the left. Um, what I'm showing you in the two lines is that the, uh, the, the, this line here, the abundance line, is their bidding in the abundance condition. And the, the steeper line here is their bidding in the scarcity condition. And what we see here, what we see fairly consistently across several studies, is that we get this kind of sharper preference uh, in scarcity. So when they like something, they're more willing to overbid for it in the um, scarcity condition. When they don't like something, they're much less likely to, uh, to bid. So what we seem to find is that people's preferences get a bit more sharp and that they're willing to kind of put their money where their mouth is uh, in scarcity. So it's some evidence for the suggestion, at least that even in this very simple lab manipulation, scarcity may change the way we, we kind of value goods. And we find that uh, supported by our uh, fMRI results, which show that when people are in the scarcity condition here on the left, we see increased activation in ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is often involved in kind of valuation. Uh, uh, of 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 um, outcomes, um, but in the uh, in the converse uh, case, when we're looking at abundance compared to scarcity, we get greater activation in these control regions like DLPFC. Um, so this again suggests that even in a, a very simple lab experiment done on you know undergraduates, you can I think successfully induce these feelings of of scarcity, and we do see um, differences in people's decision making as a consequence, and we have some insight into that. The mechanisms. So that's what we might call um, an individual decision. So th these are decisions where you know you're making a choice based on your own preferences. Um, we also do a lot of work on what are we term social decisions. So a social decision is a decision where um, you're in an interactive decision context with another person. So you don't need just want. So it's not important just to know what you feel about M and M's or carrots. It's also important to know what somebody else might feel about that. And so a good example of this might be a simple business negotiation. So if you're in a business negotiation, it's useful for you to have some insight on what the other person uh, really wants, doesn't care about, and so on. And so that's what we're studying here. These situations where my decisions are somehow contingent on what you choose and your decisions are somehow contingent on what I choose. And um, I find these decisions really, really interesting because they evoke a whole set of other preferences and, uh, and, and mechanisms that we don't see in these individual decisions. Uh, and I just want to give a, a little example to show that these social motivations uh, do turn out to be important. So this is, I like to show this picture. So if you haven't been to the Netherlands, this is kind of how the Netherlands look. Right? It's this perfectly flat landscape. Uh, there are modest people, so they have modestly sized ice cream cones and, um, you know, and, and you might wonder, and, you know, it's modestly sunny that day. Um, so, uh, but most of you, of course, can look at this, uh, this person's face and you might wonder why isn't she happy, right? This is as good as life gets here in the, in the Netherlands. There's ice cream and, and some level of sunshine. Um, and, but when I show you the rest of the picture, okay, it's usually immediately obvious to people why she looks so uh, unhappy. And so this is a classic case of what we might call social comparison, um, whereby what I have is often valued in relation to what you, what you have. And of course, if we were to put these people in the, in the scanner, we would see that she would have less <clears throat> reward activity for her ice cream cone when this guy shows up with his uh, traffic cone of sugar and fats here. So 
So social motivations turn out to be very, very important. And um, we, we keep finding that they're more powerful, I think, than, than we, we have believed in terms of uh, the, the effect they have on people's decision making. And they conjure up a lot of interesting questions around um, <clears throat> concepts like fairness, cooperation, trust, revenge, spite. So these are all social motivations. They exist only in this interactive situation, but they have surprisingly powerful impact on our decisions. And I think it's very important to understand these if we want to understand how we might impact uh, decisions at the policy level, because things like social norms, things like social comparison can be very, very powerful drivers of behavior. If, if everyone in my neighborhood is putting up solar panels, we know that's really going to enhance the likelihood that I'm going to do so as well. So understanding these social motivations has some, I think, uh, uh, important utility. Um, <clears throat> to give an example of a particular social motivation, right, that of uh, fairness, I, I'm showing this picture here. This is, this is difficult for me as an Irish uh, soccer fan to show this picture because this is a, 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 a sad moment for, for Ireland um, several years ago. Ireland in the white played France in the blue in a, in a game which was a qualifying game for the, for the World Cup finals. Um, <clears throat> towards the end of the game, the game was tied, and towards the end of the game, this illegal act of French treachery happened here. Right? You can't do this in soccer. You can't handle the ball. He did it anyway. This was before uh, you know, videos. It's, I can see I'm getting all worked up remembering this uh, sad moment. <laughs> um, what happened was th this happened. France scored a goal. Everybody uh, saw this except for uh, the referee, and so the goal was, was awarded, even though it shouldn't have been. Now, what's interesting isn't that a sportsman cheats to win a game. That happens all the time. But the reaction of the Irish people was really quite uh, interesting afterwards. So the, the day after this happened, there was a march on the French embassy in Dublin and there was official protests in the European Parliament. It's all completely insane. But um, And my favorite story, there was a little town in the middle of Ireland and they took all the French bread out of the grocery store and they burnt it all in the village square. So now, of course, this may give the impression uh, Irish people are um, uh, somewhat unhinged, but I, I, I think uh, what it really illustrates is that um, the, the extreme uh, power of this feeling of being treated unfairly. Um, so it's one thing being treated, uh, losing a game, and that, that happens to Ireland a lot. We're used to losing games, but to lose it like this feels, feels, feels difficult. And so people were willing to incur real economic costs. People would take the day off work to go and shake their fists at some poor people who happen to work in the French embassy um, in order to protest this level of injustice. So, and, and of course, we see this all over in more serious uh, matters when the, the, the banking crisis, if you remember, uh, protests and so on over being unfairly treated. So <clears throat> one challenge, of course, is to harness this. We can't sit around waiting for, uh, for such events to happen. So how can we study this in the lab and, and get a sense of and be able to induce these feelings of kind of fairness, unfairness, trust, reciprocity, and so on. So if we talk about fairness, the way we uh, study this, we're, we're very much interested in how we feel when we're treated unfairly. Um, I think another interesting question is how stable is this? Do we have a kind of a set preference for unfairness or is it, uh, you know, context dependent? And finally, what do we do about it? So what, what are people willing to do if they have been treated in an unjust fashion? So to, to answer these questions, we use a variety of tasks that we, we borrow from experimental economics and, and, and uh, develop ourselves. Um, and <clears throat> the simple, I'll just show you some simple tasks here to get a sense of how we do this. The simplest task is one simple called the ultimatum game. So the ultimatum game is a very simple task. You come into the lab and you're paired with Paul and Paul is a real person. You don't know him, but uh, he exists. And uh, I, as the experimenter, tell you and Paul that uh, you're going to play a game which involves dividing a sum of money. And so I'm going to give Paul $10. And Paul simply has the job of proposing a split of that money between him and you. And he can propose anything he wants. He can say, I'm going to keep it all. I'm going to give it all to you. We do 50-50. So anything is, uh, is possible. Okay. So, uh, and then once Paul makes a, a, a proposal, you have to decide whether or not you're going to accept it. So let's imagine Paul is sitting there in front of you and he, he decides that this is his, going to be his offer. He's going to slide over $2 to you and keep a nice crisp pile of $8 uh, in front of him. And now simply the, the decision that we're interested in is uh, what do you want to do, right? And you can do two things. You can accept this offer, in which case Paul gets $8 you get $2, the game is over, 
right? So you both walk away. Or you can say, no, you can say, I reject this offer, in which case I take back the money. Paul gets nothing, you get nothing, and the game is over. And so what we ask people simply is, do you accept or reject Paul's offer? And um, maybe you can all think a bit about what you would do in this situation. Of course, all standard economic models predict that um, it makes absolutely no sense to reject um, because $2 is better than $0. So you should always accept. And in fact, you should always accept any offer Paul makes. If he offers you one penny, you should take it because it's better than nothing. But as uh, hopefully you're at least intuiting either from yourself or from you know, what you think other people will do, a uh, substantial amount of the time this offer is turned down. So people are willing to take nothing rather than be part of this uh, unfair division. So we, we've, we've done this task many, many uh, tens of thousands of times. I can't tell you how many. It's, it's a very, very robust finding. And these are kind of typical results. So if Paul offers you five from a $10 pot, um, everybody accepts, right? The, everybody likes uh, fairness. There's no problem with that. Uh, when Paul offers you three, most people accept. They're not terribly happy about it, but they're willing to say, well, Paul has some advantage here, so he's going to uh, take advantage a little bit. But once the offers get down to two and one, as you can see, the acceptance rate drops quite precipitously. And in fact, around this one, two, so 10 or 20 percent, um, about half the time people say no. So these are people who are knowingly turning down free money. Um, because of you know, this feeling of, of unfairness that, that Paul is treating them badly and um, Paul should be punished uh, or they just don't have any part of this uh, inequitable situation. So uh, we can also, of course, look at what happens in, in, in the brain. And what we find is, again, very consistently, is we find this area called the anterior insula, uh, which is responsive to unfair offers. There's some nuances, but essentially the more unfair the offer, the more activation we have in the insula. And the insula is an interesting area for this because it had long been thought to be a very kind of fundamental somatosensory kind of cortex that uh, we know that when people are, say, hungry, thirsty, in pain, we see the insula. Uh, but of course, in, in, in these situations, there's no physical distress or discomfort, right? There's maybe moral pain ones in. Um, but it suggests that maybe these kind of uh, areas of the brain, which have been uh, typically coded for kind of physical discomfort, can also be co-opted for um, these kind of higher level uh, injustices. And in fact, we also see that the insula uh, not only is more responsive to unfair offers, but that when the insula is more active, people are more likely to reject the offer. So that suggests some uh, strong involvement of this brain area. Another area which I don't have uh, labeled here, apologies, is this uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which uh, will be important in a mom. So, you know, as a, as a, as a, a rough sketch, then we can see that you know, people do care about unfairness. They care enough to turn down money to uh, protest. And um, there does seem to be a kind of a neurobiological system that, that's heavily involved in this. And the other question, I, I, if you remember, I was, we were curious about how stable is this? So, you know, if Paul offers you two, do you feel just as aggrieved as when Jim or Jane offer you two or when you, you know, get two, two, your two dollars at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night? So how stable are these feelings of uh, unfairness? So we've done lots and lots of studies looking at um, unfairness across different contexts. Uh, I'll just go give you a few here just to demonstrate uh, the point. So, uh, so these are this is the acceptance rate for unfair offers. So these one and two dollar offers I talked about. So as you can see, the kind of standard level of uh, acceptance is around fifty percent. So half the time people say yes to these low offers, half the time they say no. So, um, so we got, we're, all, we're quite interested in kind of the emotion associated with this. And so one set of studies, we, we simply primed emotion. We had people in good mood and in a bad mood receiving unfair offers. And we were curious to see, would we move away from this 50% kind of baseline? So uh, when people were placed in a positive emotion, and we have different kinds of positive emotions, but in general, there's no effect. So, you know, a happy person is just as likely to say, and no to this unfair offer as in our standard case. Um, but the other uh, side is negative emotion. And we had a hypothesis here based on the fact that we know that uh, negative emotion tends to involve insula uh, activation. Our hypothesis was that when people were placed in a bad mood and um, when they were making them sad or angry, we would see a decline in acceptances. And that's exactly what we see. So, um, so a word of practical warning, don't try and take advantage of someone in a bad mood because they're likely to uh, object even stronger. So we see this diminution. So 
Uh, we can also look at the, the kind of flip side, which is less about the affective and more about the deliberative. So if we simply prime people with cognitive tasks, um, we get a, a rather large increase in acceptance rates. If we give people cognitive load and we overwhelm them as they're getting these unfair offers, that we can push the rate back down again. So the main take home from this is that these people's preferences are not terribly stable. So they're subject to a lot of uh, influences here, which are these are kind of not relevant to the task as such, right? These kind of independent emotion and cognition relevance. Um, and the, the other type of uh, manipulations we do are simply to uh, play with people's expectations. So um, in these studies, what we do is we tell people that Paul is a really nice guy. Paul offers pretty much everybody $5. And then Paul offers you $2. And I think you can hopefully imagine how that feels. That feels really bad. So if you've got high expectations about the world and about Paul specifically, and Paul comes in with a very low offer, um, you'll almost always reject it. So not only are people kind of have these um, outside influences, but their, their game-related influences can have a really large impact on their decisions. So um, what the take-home from this is that, you know, these, these perceptions of unfairness are very powerful in terms of their choice motivation. Uh, we can uh, tie these to rather specific brain structures, so structures involved in negative affective states and also structures involved in expectations and social norms. And, and fairness is, is, uh, can vary significantly within a person. So depending on the context, people can be more or less sensitive to uh, fairness. Um, now, of course, people are saying no in this game for a variety of reasons. So one, is, uh, one reason people give is, I say no to Paul's offer because I don't want to be part of anything Paul's part of, right? I don't want to be involved in this, or if it's not equal, I'm not interested. Uh, but another reason people say no is to punish Paul, because of course you're you're costing yourself um, two dollars, but even better, you're costing Paul eight dollars, right? So it's a way of kind of indirectly punishing Paul. And um, so we were interested in this particular motivation, and we we wanted to study this in a bit more detail. So we developed a separate task to really study punishment. So when are we willing to punish other people because they treat us unfairly? And a particular kind of punishment we're interested in is so-called costly punishment, right? It's easy to punish people for free, but what if it actually costs you to punish? And we think this is more analogous to the real world where, you know, you can't just run around punishing people. There's often consequences to that. So uh, we wanted to make this consequential. That is, you have to basically pay in order to punish um, an, another person. So uh, we have a slightly different game here. I won't get into the details. The, the, the basic point is that um, you're in the role of the partner in this game. You're paired with a so-called taker. And the basic point is that at some point, the taker takes your chips. And they're clearly not supposed to do this. They're clearly the norm is that they don't take. So, but they do take sometimes. And um, so people reliably feel that this is a, a kind of an aggressive uh, act and it's uh, unfair and unjust. And the question is, we're interested, what do people do? And we're interested in this across three different scenarios. One is that you're the victim. So the taker takes from you. And you can then go and punish the taker afterwards. So you can enact some kind of punishment on, uh, on him. Uh, a second scenario is that you're is what we call a third party game. So you watch somebody else being treated unjustly, and then you can punish the perpetrator. And then a third condition is uh, you, you witnessed an injustice, but now instead of punishing the perpetrator, now you can compensate the victim. So here we're interested in what are people's preferences? Do they rather punish or do they rather compensate? And so um, to, to get straight to the data, what we the first thing we find is that people are willing to pay to punish or compensate across all uh, conditions. So uh, that at least suggests that you know, people are, are willing to here put their money where their mouth is and they're willing to, to incur a cost when something bad happens. If we compare the different types of punishment, Somewhat unsurprisingly, um, people are more willing to punish when they've been the victim than when they witness somebody else being the victim. And <clears throat> when we compare punishment and compensation, we find people prefer to punish. So I'd rather punish somebody who did something bad than compensate someone who was the victim of this injustice. And <clears throat> we can also look, of course, at the, at the brain and see how this, uh, these mechanisms might be instantiated. Uh, first, I'll show you that in, when bad things happen, we also get the insula, as we did in the previous uh, study, showing that there's some consistency in this neural response to unfairness across uh, 
across tasks and across participants. Uh, interestingly, when we compare punishment and compensation, uh, it seems to be driven by striatal activation. So as you know, this is heavily involved with the brain's reward system, at least suggesting that there may be some reward, uh, reward related activity may be greater when you're punishing someone who's done something bad than compensating uh, a victim. And uh, let me skip that. And <clears throat> what I want to illustrate here is that we can also use these uh, approaches from economics to, to, to model how um, people behave in these tasks. So here we have a, a, a utility model. I, um, I will not go through the details. It's far too late here for me to be going through um, <clears throat> details of utility models. But uh, what I want to point out is that these, these models, are, I think, are very, very useful in formalizing the decision process. And so what we've done here is we've said that the decision process is likely under, underpinned by two, two types of decision. One is do I want to punish this person? This person has behaved badly towards me. Do I want to punish them? And we think this is represented, or we, we posit that this is represented by our uh, theta parameter here. Um, and if I make the decision to punish, now what amount of punishment do I think is appropriate? And this is represented by the alpha parameter. And what we can do with these models is, of course, we can fit these models to, to our participants. We can estimate these parameters for each of our participants. And so we can use this a kind of as an index and then look and see, do brain areas correlate with these parameters in general, right? So do we see specific brain areas which correlate with this theta parameter? And then we can make, I think, a reasonable inference that these brain areas may be involved in this decision to punish. And when we do this, we find that there's a correlation with anterior insula. Again, as we predict, the more unfair people find the particular uh, injustice, the more willing they are to punish. And... We also find it correlated with these uh, more uh, cognitive control errors, but only for the third party game. So only when I'm trying to think about, I'm witnessing some injustice and I'm trying to decide what to do about it. However, when we look at this decision of how much to punish, so how much, uh, how much uh, uh, am I willing to spend or how much cost do I want the other person to incur, we find this a correlation with the amygdala. So we can use these approaches to start to parse out different uh, brain networks that may be involved in different uh, parts of this decision process. Um, and of course, by using models like this, it really forces us to think through that we can't just kind of wave our hands and say they decide to, to, to punish. It forces us to think through this in a more formal way. Um, <clears throat> just so, uh, so I just want to end with a, just a couple of uh, one study just so we don't all and go around depressed at the injustice and punishment in the world. So I would like to end with a, a study that we do looking at pro-social choice. Um, so when, <clears throat> under what circumstances and, and what are the mechanisms involved in, in kind of positive behavior when we're, we're doing something nice for somebody else and we're returning a favor that we don't have to do. And uh, this is often termed an economic puzzle. So uh, economists are often puzzled by such behavior because in a sense it's uh, you know it's costly um, and it, it, there's no immediate benefit to this so so I think the the, the, the question to be answered is, is what you know why do people engage in pro-social behavior what might the motivations be for behaving pro-socially towards others so when are we pro-social and you know what are the underlying motivations and so there's been a couple of theories proposed uh, in the field um, as to what really underlies our motivation to uh, return a favor. And they've all been tested in this context of, uh, this is another economic game called the trust game. So <clears throat> again, it's a fairly straightforward game. We can do very easily in the lab and it nicely evokes people's uh, sense of uh, responsibility as I'll show. So let's imagine you come into the lab, you're gonna be paired now with Jack. Again, Jack is a real person. Uh, Jack, um, you don't know Jack. Uh, and the, the, you, you know, you're both fully aware of the rules of the game. Um, and so Jack now is being given $10 and, and this is a two-step game. So Jack's, the first step is that Jack can choose to invest some of his money with you, okay? Uh, and so let's imagine Jack decides to invest $8 with you. So what Jack knows in advance and what you know in advance is whatever he decides to invest in you, I'm going to quadruple, okay? So whatever he gives to you, uh, I'm going to multiply by four and then you're going to get that total amount. So it's it's often this trust game is often sometimes called the investment game, right? Jack is making an investment in you um, and he knows the kind of the rate of return to you. So that's the first part of the game. That's the trust. And um, the more interesting part is the second part where you can decide if you so choose to return some of this money back to Jack. 
But importantly, you don't have to. And also importantly, this is what we call a one-shot game. You're only going to interact Jack with Jack this one time. So you have a decision to make here. Um, that is, there's you. Across the table from you is Jack. In front of the table of you is $32. And to the right of you is the door. And you can take that money and walk out the door and there's nothing Jack can do about it, okay? Uh, or you can choose to return some of this money back to him. So the question we simply ask the participants is, how much of this $32 dollars do you want to return to Jack? And we get a really interesting variety of responses, right? We get some people who say, Jack is going to get nothing. I'm going to keep all the money, more fool him for uh, trusting me. We get some people who want to, you know, uh, give Jack 16 is a very common response. I'll split the money with Jack. So he, he, um, he gets the profit from his own trust. Um, and, you know, we get a variety of responses in between. So, but the, the vast majority of participants do return money back to Jack. So one question is, why do they do this? So why are they engaged in this pro-social behavior with a person they've never met and are likely never going to meet again? So what are the motivations underlying this behavior? So a couple of theories have been proposed, as I mentioned. One is that the, the notion of equity, that people don't like inequitable outcomes. That is, in this particular situation, I have 32, Jack has two, and kind of morally, that's not right. We should have the same or close to the same as possible. So in the, with this motivation, that's, this would be why people would transfer, say, half of their money back to Jack. Um, so this notion of the kind of moral principle of, of equity or, or equality. Uh, another motivation, though, that we found is that uh, this notion of expectation, right? So that is the reason I'm giving money back to Jack here is because, well, I know Jack kind of expects it, right? Jack didn't give me this money to enrich me purely. He gave me this money because he knew it would be multiplied and he probably expects me to send something back, okay? So this is kind of underlying, that this motivation is kind of underlies this notion of kind of guilt that I'm going to give money back to Jack because I'd feel really bad if I didn't because I know he expects it. So these are two potential uh, uh, theories. They're, it's actually quite difficult to distinguish between these motivations in terms of behavior because both of these theories in, um, in the example I just gave would involve Jack giving you back about, sorry, would involve you giving Jack back about $16. So if we just look at the, the, what people do in this task alone, it's quite difficult to uh, discern these different motivations. And the second reason we wanted to do this study is because um, it may be that different people have different motivations. So we're all comfortable with the notion that different people have different moral principles. Um, and perhaps this is the case for reciprocity. That is, I might give because my Irish Catholic background evokes a lot of guilt in me. And so I give because I don't want to feel bad for letting Jack down or somebody else gives because they feel it's the kind of moral and principled thing to do. So a secondary goal of this study is to look at individual differences in these type of uh, in these type of behavior. So the way we try and distinguish between these uh, two uh, theories is by changing the game very, very slightly. So this is the standard game I just showed you here. And the important things uh, to point out are that you have $32 and Jack believes you have $32, right? So everybody has the same beliefs here. Um, but in this version of the task that we did something uh, kind of sneaky, that is on certain trials, Jack would transfer money to you um, sorry, Jack would transfer money to you. But instead of multiplying it by four, we actually multiply it by six. But importantly, we don't tell Jack this. Okay, so Jack believes you have 32, but you actually have 48. So now we can look at see what the two different theories would predict, uh, uh, what behavior they would predict. So the, what they would predict is that <clears throat> these are the two relevant numbers. I actually have $48. Jack thinks I have $32. Now, if you're a so-called expectation follower, that is, you want to, you know, match Jack's, but you don't want to let Jack down. The, the logic goes that Jack believes you have 32. So if I give Jack back 16, half of that, he'll be perfectly happy and I'll get to kind of keep the change and no one will ever know any different. However, if you're a so-called equity follower, that is, you think the principle at stake here is that I should share my money with Jack doesn't really matter what Jack thinks. It's, I know I have 48, so I should give him then 24. So we can then, of course, look at people's behavior and posit that if people are giving around 16, they're probably motivated by expectations. 
And if they're giving around 24, they're probably motivated by equity. And just to make life uh, a little, not so easy for our expectation followers here who get to make more money, on certain trials, we also do the following where we multiply the amount by two. So now if you're an expectation follower, you have to give all of your $16 to Jack because that's what Jack expects. And that really hurts for people to do. Whereas now if you're an equity follower, you say, well, I have 16, I'll give half to Jack and that, that's the best I can do. So we make it uh, kind of comparable over the long run what people do. So what do people actually do? Let me skip this. So one way we can infer what people do uh, is again, we create this, this uh, utility model to try and quantify people's motivations. And there's two parameters which are important here. Um, there's this uh, theta parameter again, and we have this phi parameter. So the, the theta parameter is, I'm sorry, the phi parameter is um, says what we show people. Uh, hang on, let me, it's easier to explain here, is it? Oh, no, no, I was like, sorry. The, sorry, the theta parameter here gives people's uh, financial gain relative to their social gain, right? So that basically captures whether people are greedy or not. If people are not greedy, the other parameter shows how well they fit an expectation model versus an equity model. So we can we can use this parameter to assess whether we think people are giving because, <clears throat> excuse me, they want to match Peter's expectations or because they want to do this kind of moral principle of uh, fairness. So the way we can assess this is that we can create this so-called moral strategy space. Um, and so we can look at people who are greedy. This is the kind of behavioral pattern. So greedy people just keep the money. Always about 5% of people just keep all the money. So beware those 5% of people out there. Um, there's a, another group of people are these what so-called equity followers. There's a, these are people who always give half of whatever they have in a given situation. There's the group of people which are we call expectation followers. So these are people who always give Jack the same because Jack always believes they have the same. So they, 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 they keep it at that 16. And then we have this interesting group of people who are, we term moral opportunists. So these are people who are um, take a different strategy depending on whether that's what's the best strategy for them at that moment. So these aren't greedy people. They are being moral. They are giving money back to Jack, but they tend to pick the cheapest strategy. So if I go back to our uh, situations here, in this situation, a moral opportunist would say, well, I think the right thing to do here is give Jack back uh, half of what he thinks I have. So I'll give him back 16. Okay, And then we give him this trial and the moral opportunist says, well, I think the right thing to do is to give half of this 16 and not half of this 32. So they'll change their principles be, uh, to, to, to suit what's, what's, what's best for them. Uh, and what we can do, of course, we can use these parameter values and then we can estimate uh, a parameter space here. What I'm showing you here is uh, every, every symbol here represents a different subject, uh, participant in our experiment. And we can see how people then kind of cluster across these different strategies. So you can see there's a reasonable um, dispersion of people across these four strategies. So we can use these approaches to look and see uh, what specific individual differences there might be in this kind of reciprocity behavior. And then we can follow this up by looking at the brain and saying, do different types of moral strategies seem to uh, recruit different uh, brain networks? And the, the simple answer is yes, they do. So um, strategies which are so-called equity following, that is this kind of moral principle of, of, of equal division, uh, tend to engage this unique brain pattern across medial prefrontal, dorsal, anterior cingular cortex. Whereas people who follow this kind of expectation-based strategy, not letting Jack down, have this pattern in different brain regions. So anterior insula, putamen, and uh, dorsal medial and dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And their moral opportunists tend then to switch between brain representations and brain strategies. Um, and this is just a, the, the final slide. And this is just to show these are three separate replications of this study. Uh, and showing in the distribution of participants across these different moral strategies. And so one interesting thing we find is that we can do different versions of the task. We can have quite different uh, uh, participant groups and they all cluster quite similarly. So this suggests there may be some, or at least one kind of provocative hypothesis we want to start testing is, you know, is this somehow an optimal distribution of, of uh, moral strategies across a population that if we were all the same, it wouldn't uh, lead to as good outcomes if there was this uh, mix of strategies um, 
in evidence. Okay. So, oops. So to, to sum up this, this last part, um, the, the, the kind of take home of this pro-social that um, <clears throat> we can quantify these, uh, these decisions, both computationally and, and neurally. Uh, we do see different motivations evident across different people. So maybe there is a kind of a distinct moral phenotype. And I think uh, this was summed up best by a, a countryman of mine a long time ago, George Bernard Shaw, who said, you know, we all know what the golden rule is. Shaw said, you should not do unto others as you would want them to do unto you as their tastes may not be the same, right? So this captures this notion of um, if we assume everybody adheres to the same moral principle, it may be quite difficult then to, to if we extend this kind of policy uh, related uh, decision making, it, it's useful to know what's driving people's behavior. We shouldn't assume that everyone is driven by the same type of uh, moral principle. So, um, so to summarize, uh, you know, this and, and what I've tried to show you is that the importance of certainly in the latter part of the importance of non-economic motivations in understanding decision making. Often policy uh, has a tool, which is uh, incentives, uh, often kind of financial or economic incentives. And while they can be useful and they can certainly work, um, we make a lot of our decisions based on non-economic motivation. So things like uh, fairness, justice, trust, reciprocity, revenge, spite, so on. So understanding those, I think, is really important if we want to try and think about how we might usefully um, um, uh, impact uh, policy and, this, and kind of public decision making as a consequence. Um, what I've also tried to show is that what well, we try and use a lot of different approaches, uh, hopefully not in a haphazard way, but a lot of different approaches to try and kind of triangulate the mechanisms. And um, there's a lot of different techniques out there now, which uh, are, have, have obviously pros and cons, but using a variety we, we find uh, really helps us try and clarify these, uh, these uh, decision factors. And I hope, uh, you know, I think this is where the jumping off point for us is that how we can use these findings and insights in informing societal questions. And of course, that's that's the tricky part. Um, uh, so we're, we're engaged in quite a few field studies now where we're, we're not just doing our lab studies, but we're looking at these kind of um, factors in, in more kind of realistic scenarios. And, and we hope that will help us uh, get to uh, a point where we can start making useful inroads into uh, public policy. But with that for now, I will, um, I will say thank you to you all for for listening and um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions people might have.